Okay. So, yeah, as you see today, it's me that I, I'm doing the lecture because Andras is away. And uh, yeah, he told me to do some stuff. I'm not so sure whether I will succeed, but uh, I will do my best uh, to do it. Okay. <clears throat> um, now today, like the first, uh, first topic is the splitting principle. Okay, the splitting principle is, um, um, is that one that uh, allows you to formalize that uh, sentence uh, when you say, okay, let's compute the churn class of some vector bundles, and uh, we can suppose that this vector bundle is the sum of line bundles. Uh, in my opinion, this sentence, as it's as it told is like that, it doesn't mean absolutely anything, because uh, I, I don't know how to give a cent out of this. Uh, by the way, out of this we have uh, lots of um, uh, applications and uh, we can finally, for example, compute uh, in a rigorous way what is the churn class of a tensor bundle or, uh, or a tensor product of bundles or uh, of the churn class of a dual bundle, finally. So, so what is the theorem? So let this goes like V over X vector bundle of rank R over X smooth manifold then there exists A smooth manifold Y and in the map from Y to X such that the pullback bundle of V, which is a bundle over I admits a filtration so 0 v1 v2 etc up to vr which is um, 5 star v with the um, with the rank of uh, vi over vi minus 1 equal to 1 for each i. Okay. So this is the theorem. Of course, once we know that, uh, we, we know how to compute. Uh, Yes, uh, yeah, th that's important, yes. Yeah, also, also, yeah, I forgot. Uh, also, P star should be from A, um, in this case, it's from AX to AI, AY is injective. So this is... Uh, Right. So, um, so uh, okay. The statement of the theorem is that there exists a smooth manifold Y and the map phi from Y to X, such that phi star is injective and such that the pullback bundle admits a filtration. Uh, once we know that, by naturality we can compute the churn class uh, at least uh, in the image uh, of phi star. And. Uh, and since the pullback bundle had admits this filtration, we can use a witness theorem, witness formula. Okay, so now try to prove it. At least it will not be a complete proof, but uh, like the, the main part. Okay, now just uh, let's, de let's define what is Y. So, 
over x, and that is phi, the projection of the bundle. Uh, let's define the flag bundle. What is that? Phi, Fv over, um, over x is, uh, is the set of flags of, uh, of Vx. So it's the set of 0, <coughs> psi 1, psi, psi uh, r in Vx. Complete. So the, this is the uh, the flag bundle. I actu actually, yes. Yeah, so either we say yeah, either we say r minus one, which is uh, contained in Vx, or we say that x uh, that c, x c r is Vx. But yeah, let's let's uh, stop in uh, r minus one in this case. <coughs> so complete flag. And phi is just the projection. We show now that um, actually phi star of V admits the filtration of, of the theorem with vi okay now phi star v is uh, a bundle on the flag bundle so we must specif specify what's the fiber over an element of the flag bundle which is uh, a flag and uh, a point of x this is simply xi i Okay, which is uh, by definition inside uh, Vx, which is uh, the fiber of phi star V over X. And the same. Yeah, the other doesn't matter because over phi it's projected. So that's it. Okay, so now we have a filtration. It's um, perfectly well defined and the quotients are of rank one because uh, the XI uh, by definition are a complete flag. So we only need to show that uh, that P star from AX Ay is injective. And to do this, uh, we use some sort of um, <coughs> characterization or construction of the flag bundle through uh, successes, successive uh, projectivization of uh, our bundle. So let us consider Projectivization. Then we know we know by uh, um, by a theorem that uh, we saw last time that. Ax in, in APV is injected. That's a theorem that we saw last time. Any, <coughs> any projectivized vector bundle induces an injective morphism in the Chow groups, Chow rings. Now, Consider S, let's call this uh, pi, 
the tautological bundle, which is a, a sub-bundle of uh, P star V. So there is an exact sequence of zero S P star V and the quotient bundle zero. So Q is the quotient Q it's a bundle now over PV, it's a vector bundle. And we can still projectivize it. PQ over PV. Now we can repeat the procedure once again. It means that we take, um, uh, in our case, uh, pi star of V here, and we take the pullback of this. We will have a tautological subbundle. And then we will have a quotient bundle that we can projectivize, etc. So continue. Same procedure. Actually, R, R minus one times, I think. Or R times. No, I think R minus one times. The final space will be. The final space will be FV as a projective bundle over the uh, last minus one space. And so we take uh, all the composition of these projective bundles and we will have exactly our flag bundle over X. So um, let's say P, uh, let us call it Q, R minus, uh, this is R minus one, so R minus two. V X. The composition will be our flag bundle. Now, each of the maps induces an injective morphism in the Chow rings because it's just a projectivization of the vector bundles. So, since at every level, the induced map on Chow rings is injective. Therefore, therefore uh, uh, the whole map, which is a composition of injective maps, will be injective. Okay, um, yeah, it's uh, not a totally complete proof because uh, uh, if you remember uh, that theorem, um, th the fact that uh, the induced map of a projectivized uh, vector bundle is injective uh, has not been proved last time. Uh, but you can see the proof on um, Eisenbad, chapter seven, if I not mistake. Well, it depends on the edition, but the proof is a nice amount of the fact that uh, uh, it's kind of interesting. You should look it up. Okay, now I will leave it this and the proof I can, it's less important. Now, um, okay, now to, out of this we can make some applications. Okay, first uh, some remarks. Okay, maybe a remark. How can we use uh, Whitney's formula in that setting, in the setting of a filtration? 
any idea? I mean, why witness formula can be used in the, in the filtration? What does it mean? What does witness formula says? What is, uh, what is uh, the churn class of, uh, of phi star v? It's the product of the churn, total churn class of all these line bundles. Which line bundles? bundles? These quotients. These quotients. But in fact, have we even proven Whitney's formula? I don't think so. Because the splitting principle is a nice way to prove Whitney's formula. Sorry? The splitting principle is a good way to prove Whitney's formula. Well, but you need Whitney's formula to write this, right? Well, I don't remember the precise proof. But no, but or, or you can define a churn class like this, and then in this case, Whitney's formula is trivial. Or you have witness formula, and in that case, you deduce uh, that the churn class of phi star v is this. But, uh, okay, this is just a, let's take witness formula as granted. <coughs> and, um, and let's prove this. I mean, how, how can we prove this? So, first of all, uh, uh, what do we have? We have, uh, we start from uh, the top, so r minus one is inside phi star v, is inside the first quotient, so v r minus one, which is like v r over v r minus one, okay? So by witness formula, v is equal to c v r minus one, c v r, the r minus one. Now we repeat uh, the same with v r minus one. So we have zero v r minus two this time v r minus one v r minus one over v r minus two zero. So we get that v c v r minus one is the product of uh, C of this quotient times uh, C of uh, the previous, so V R minus two, V R minus one. Here I'm using witness formula many times. So we substitute now here and we repeat the procedure with the C V R minus two, etc. until eventually we will, you will, we will get exactly the product of all the quotients. And this by naturality is also phi star of C V. <coughs> so this means that um, Whenever we are able to compute uh, the churn class of these quotients, we have the class of this bundle. This is true also if V is not a direct sum of bundles. Also if uh, uh, phi star V is not a direct sum of bundles. Because the important thing is that we have a filtration. Okay, now let's try to, to get our hands dirty. So let, let us compute, okay, application. Application one. Let us try to, uh, let V a vector bundle. And L a line bundle now let us try to compute the churn class of the tensor product v and l we use the splitting principle so phi 
from x to from y to x as in the split limp uh, theorem. Then we know that we have uh, zero v one v um, r, which is equal to phi star v. Now we also have phi star l vector bundle over uh, y, and it will be a line bundle over y. So we can tensorize, and we get 0 v1 tensor v star l tensor vr v star l, which is v star of uh, V tensor phi star of L, which is a phi star of V tensor L. Okay. Now, what about the quotients? Okay, here it's a perfectly good filtration. What are the quotients? VI tensor phi L quotiented VI minus 1 tensor phi star L which is equal to v1, uh, vi, vi minus 1, tensor phi star l. Since in the vector bundle uh, uh, k is a tensoring uh, with another vector bundle is a flat operation. It, uh, it's an exact operation. So we have this. But now we have one because this is a line bundle, tensor line bundle. This is still a line bundle. And we know what is the churn class of a line bundle. That's it. That, or, or a tensor product of line bundles. We know that. Now, churn class of V i, V i minus 1, tensor V star L is equal to 1 plus C1 V1 i minus 1, plus uh, I also use naturality in one go, plus this, c1, sorry. So this is uh, the churn class of the quotient, of the ith quotient. Therefore, we can say that uh, phi star See, we, we always have to be like careful of putting phi star. Uh, eventually, it will not be very painful because phi star is uh, injective. So if we manage to put like phi star in one part and phi star in the other part, then we can deduce that uh, also the arguments are the same. <laughs> but uh, we, we should, at least at the beginning, we should be careful. This is equal to the product <coughs> over i of 1 plus c1 vi over vi minus 1 plus phi c1. So, uh, so this is it, but still uh, it's not a very pleasant form. I mean, still, still it's kind of mysterious what's the, the churn class of, uh, of the tensor product, because uh, here there is a phi star here and here there is nothing. There is phi star, I mean, it's, it's not very pleasant, so until now we, We didn't discover much. But the point is that then one of the, one of the good properties of the pullback is that it's also uh, homogeneous. So the naturality is true for every churn class in any dimension, for, for any CK. So we can look at this. C1 VL, then it's exactly the T 
term of degree one of this. So it is, what is the term of degree one of this? If we compute it, it's uh, the sum over i of C1 VI over VI minus one. And then uh, there is the same uh, game that we did uh, like in the exercise series, uh, like we should uh, count how many of these factors uh, we, we gain during the product and we gain exactly the number of factors here, so R. So plus R phi star C1L, okay? Almost finished. The point is that this is equal to the first, the first chain class of phi star V. which is phi star of C1 V. And now we won, really, because we have a phi star, phi star and phi star. Since phi star is injective, we deduce C1 V tensor L is equal to, uh, here we have C1 V plus R C1 L. Notice that uh, unlike in the exercise series in which it was explicitly uh, written that you had to suppose that V is the direct sum of line bundles, and n was another direct sum of line bundles, and then you can use the Whitney's formula. Here I have uh, no assumptions. So it means that this formula is, uh, is general enough. And this is the first instance uh, of the principle that we can always assume uh, in terms of churn classes that uh, any vector bundle is a direct sum of, uh, of line bundles. But still, I don't, um, I, I cannot make much of sense out of this statement. It's not really a statement. We can suppose that uh, any vector bundle is direct sum of line bundles in terms of chair classes. I mean, it's not clear. Uh, so application two. Uh, for, first of all, I want to, to give just uh, as, um, Just as a homework, if you want, maybe it will be in the next exercise series, uh, or maybe we can also do that. Using the same procedure, we have a formula, rather simple formula <coughs> of V tensor L, which is sum for i goes from zero to k <coughs> of r minus one, uh, r minus i, k minus i, c1 l, k minus i, c1, c, uh, sorry, c i, c i, CI. Yeah, only the um, computation are slightly more painful, but not too much. You just have to expand this and uh, be careful of uh, picking all the terms of the same degree. But it's uh, kind of instructive like to do the same game. Like uh, at first, uh, we have some mixed equality in the sense that we have some phi stars that uh, dance somewhere and not everywhere. Like here, here we have phi star here, phi star here, but not here. The point is that uh, we, 
we gained one five star while we passed from here to here. And so, yes. I'm sorry, what's the index um, or for the last turn class? I. Yeah, because we are i k minus i, so it's like uh, something of degree k. Uh, wait. Yeah, maybe the indexes are are wrong. It's not index. Sorry. C one instead of C I. Ah, of course. Yeah, sure, sure. Ah, sure, because here it's uh, K minus I and I. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course, uh, C I L uh, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, L is a line bundle. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. One. And uh, okay, very good. So this is it. So other uh, application. Well, maybe not here. Now I can, I can erase this. I think you already understood. Okay, now let's compute the churn class of the dual bundle, finally. I mean, it's like three exercise series that uh, we have discussed this and uh, everybody knew the answer, but uh, we could not uh, use this answer because uh, we still did. But now we can. Let us compute this. So how can we do that? We still have a phi, y to x, splitting principle. Now zero, v1, v R, which is phi star v. And now what? Now I take the dual filtration. No, of course, there is no dual filtration. It's not clear. We have no, we have no um, uh, concept of orthogonal or uh, splitting or whatever. Wasn't the trick to take V tensor V star because that's and what's the V tensor V star? Because this is a trivial bundle. Ah uh, no, it is not trivial bundle. V tensor V star is not trivial at all. If uh, V is a line bundle, then yes. But if V is any vector bundle, V tensor V star is the bundle is the we call it endomorphism bundle of V. Okay. It has uh, a trivial component, which is the identity because the identity is always a well-defined section. So it means that it splits uh, always in a trivial bundle plus uh, all the others. But all the others is not trivial at all. Of course, in the rank one case, it's just trivial. If it's a line bundle, yes. But in the general case, it's not trivial. Here we can do a nice sequence. We do a nice sequence and then the, the fact is that we don't have a filtration. If we do a lies, we have like a, a sequence of maps. We don't need filtration, I guess. What? We don't need filtration, I guess. Which one? No, we get something. Okay, okay, never mind. It's, it's, not so, it, it, it's, it's not so, I mean, I thought a little bit of that. I, I think that you can do that uh, with some mumbo jumbo. But there is a much more natural way how to do that. Just uh, looking at the... Uh, the quotients, looking at uh, all the successive quotients. So we know, for example, that we have uh, zero vr minus one, vr, vr, vr minus one, zero. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This can be dualized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this can be dualized, yielding. Vr over Vr minus one dual. <coughs> Vr dual. Vr minus one dual. So we find out that C V R star, which is a uh, well, this is uh, the full, so this is phi star of CV, is uh, C of VR, uh, the VR minus one dual, 
tensor C VR minus 1 dO. We repeat the same procedure for VR minus 1 dO. And we find that actually, as it should be, or as you probably already know, this. Notice that uh, in the case uh, V, uh, VR, okay, let, let's write this uh, in one go as phi star C, V star. Notice that in the case that this is a direct sum of line bundles, this simply means that uh, dualizing a direct sum amounts to dualizing every term which is um, obvious, more or less, in the case of finite sum. So, uh, okay, so now let's continue. This is product of one plus psi one, psi one of vi, vi minus one dual. And in the case of dual line bundles, because of uh, what Rick was saying, the fact that if we tensorize line bundle, tensor dual line bundle, then we get the trivial bundle, that is true. Then we can write this as one minus C1 VI over VI minus one, okay? So, what do we get finally? So what's CK, like phi star of CK of B dual? We have to take uh, the kth products. We don't do it because it's just exactly the same as with plus, but with minus one to the power of k. And then we do exactly the same as with plus, but with plus we know that it's the churn class of v with phi star. So phi star of churn class of v. Since we have phi star in uh, both sides, and phi star is injective, we can then deduce CK V dual is minus one to the K CK V. Okay. Also this, if you write V as a direct sum of line bundle, or, or maybe if you suppose that V can be written as a direct sum of line bundles, then, like, remark, still LK, then V dual is L1 dual plus LK dual, then the churn class of V dual is the product of one plus C one of L I dual, which is one minus C one of L I dual. Uh, no, sorry, here it's not dual anymore. And so we find exactly the same stuff. Is equal to minus one to the power of K times, uh, uh, say, the term of degree K in one plus C 
at i, which is exactly, by definition, CK of V. <coughs> so if we don't want to use, uh, uh, like uh, suppose you have a vector bundle in front of you and you want to compute the churn class of uh, something of this vector bundle, say of the dual. It's not needed uh, like to pass through the splitting principle, like to recall the exact statement of the splitting principle, to take like the pullback of uh, that uh, admits this filtration, etc., etc. You can just say, okay, let's suppose V is the sum of the line bundles, and let let's try to apply uh, like just a basic linear algebra to this case, and you get the right result. But it's uh, some sort of heuristic, if you want. At least I think it's uh, some sort of heuristic. It's not really a, um, a rigorous uh, statement or procedure or whatever. Okay, so let's have a break. Now. Okay, so. <coughs> now we focus our uh, attention on the, on the Grassmannians. What's that? on the Grassmannian and we prove uh, some decomposition of the Grassmannian, some stratification, which is the stratification in uh, Schubert cells. And we find that it also can help in a conceptual way at least uh, to understand the churn classes of vector bundles in general. Okay, now, so, Schubert. Now, uh, yeah, I still hate this. Now, the setting here is uh, a vector space. Of dimension n. And we fix V V one V N a complete flag. Okay. Uh, so a complete flag meaning that uh, all these vector spaces have dimension, like VI has dimension I. Now, we consider, we concentrate our, ourselves in the study of the Grassmannian of uh, K planes uh, in VN, in V, sorry, so, KV. What we do now is to fix a sequence of k integers, so a i z, such that n minus k, so they are all uh, uh, at most n minus k, and they are they form a decreasing sequence of positive integers. So decreasing sequence of positive integers, everybody smaller than or equal to n minus k. And we define, let me put here, and we define this set that a priori depends on v, is the set of lambda, here in GR, GRKV, such that uh, the dimension of lambda intersected V N minus K plus I minus AI, that's a terrible index, but it's like that. 
is bigger than i for every i. And maybe it's even wrong. No, it's, it's, it's good. Yeah, seeing like that, this definition as a, um, as a particular feature and the feature of being basically incomprehensible because it's not very, it's not very clear geometrically what, uh, what does it is. Already this index is, uh, at least uh, in my opinion, it's crazy. I mean, I don't see, I don't see just uh, in one go what, what it means. So it's good like to, to have some sort of, uh, of um, representations of these uh, planes. So what's the procedure? Okay, let's make an example, like an explicit example. So let's uh, try for example GR, there's some big numbers, not so big maybe, but four, seven. Let's say three, seven, four, seven. Is, that will be isomorphic. Let's say GR three, seven. And let's take as A, now should be three integers, both, uh, well, all three smaller than or equal to four and decreasing. So let's take, for example, three, one, one. This is a good uh, sequence that satisfies this equation. Okay, now we can choose a basis of V such that VI is equal to the vector space generated by the first I basic element. So basis EI of V such that those are the first one. Now, um, what is a lambda inside uh, lambda in, um, in, uh, in sorry, it should be sigma A. How can we represent lambda in sigma a? We have to give vectors of uh, its basis and uh, can uh, express this, this vector in terms of the basis that we already have. And this is the point, okay. We make a matrix, which is three times seven. Why this? Why this matrix three times seven? It is uh, nothing else than the representation of the basic basis vector of uh, lambda. So, basis vector of lambda. Okay, now it's three times seven. So, here we have one, two, three, and we make uh, this uh, triangle of zeros. Once we have this, now with another color, let's say orange, we add at the end as many zeros as the elements of A. Okay, so it is the third row, we add A three zeros, zero, one zero. It is the second row, one zero, and now we have three zero to add in the first row. Yes. Okay. And then we fill with the with uh, I don't know what, uh, nobody knows what. <coughs> we feel the other elements. So 
it means that uh, any vector, uh, any basis, so like, like this is a V1, V2, and V3, and lambda is V1, V2, V3. So, so this is the, how you should see it, at least uh, in my opinion, because seeing it this way is easier. So lambda is in sigma A if and only if they are basic vectors in terms of uh, E1 uh, En, the basis of V that we have chosen. It's of this form. That's, uh, that's, I think it's more, uh, uh, it's more concrete and so it, you, you can, can understand that better. So now, uh, okay, now let's make some uh, explicit examples. <coughs> For example, if A is A1 and all zeros, what is uh, sigma A? Well, sigma A is the set of uh, lambda that have, uh, well, um, just uh, forgive me this notation, the set of lambdas that have uh, which kind of basis? Here we don't, uh, like we add zeros only in the first row and on the other rows we simply follow the principal uh, uh, triangle in the, in the flag. So, now we have zero, here we have the principal triangle. Of zeros, we fill everything except in the first row. We add a one. We add a one zeros. Okay. So here it's everything is filled, and here everything is filled up to here. Okay. Now, what does this mean? So, when lambda is of this form. Sigma A, if and only if. Let's look at the first row. How many terms are there? I mean, here, how many zeros are there? K minus one. Here are n elements. So there are here n minus k plus one minus a one elements. And lambda is in a, a is here, if and only if it's in this, uh, it's in this uh, way. Notice that we have an element which is uh, where? So th this is V1. V1 is in, in the element of the flag of this index. So V n minus k plus one minus a one. So any uh, element of sigma a must have a vector here and also vice versa you can uh, you can show that it's if and only if v n minus k plus one minus a one is not zero so sigma a in this case are the um, uh, spaces that that intersect v n minus k plus one minus a one. I know that the index is a li little bit twisted, non-trivially. Let's look at another example. I think that examples uh, are the only way to get acquainted with this uh, machinery. So there is a, a obvious extreme example in the case in which every every element is n minus. Uh, uh, sorry, every element is something. So let's say uh, L. Hmm? 
with, of course, n minus k bigger or equal to L. Then sigma a for the same reason. What is that? We simply we add L zeros in every row. So we have uh, we have the principal triangle at the end, and then we add L zeros in every row. So L L okay. Now, what can you what can you deduce? Look at the last one. There are n minus l elements here, non-zero elements, and all the others are less. So that means that the lambda. So let's take lambda in sigma a. In this case, lambda is uh, contained in v n minus l. Do you agree? Because every element in uh, in in lambda has at most uh, element of the basis until to in, um, uh, until index uh, n minus l. So it should be contained in Vn minus L. So it's V contained in lambda contained in V n minus L. Other extreme case in which is uh, it's n minus k. And we have uh, say R of this. We do the same. So. We do the same here. The matrix is how we start uh, adding uh, n minus k zeros. Uh, no, no, sorry, it's, it's the converse. We start uh, adding zero, adding no zeros at all. So let's write, let's draw the principal triangle. So we add n minus k zeros, but okay, so here we have um, k minus one. We add n minus k zeros, we are left with, with only one element. Only one. And then, until R row, we add n minus k zeros. And we color the other elements. And then, we know nothing. So what does this mean? <clears throat> Let us look at VK or VK minus R maybe. Should take oh, VR. <clears throat> Yes, uh, let's look at VR. Like, let's try to, to check that uh, now VR is contained in lambda. How can we show that VR is contained in lambda? It means that every EI is in lambda unt until R, which is true. For example, E1 is contained in lambda. Because basically we have, we have we have here and here, so 
I mean, just to check that it's the, is the case. So we can uh, see the Schubert classes as uh, incidence conditions or containment conditions, or let's say incident, incidence conditions. <coughs> we have some properties. So properties. First of all, let's suppose that uh, A is uh, smaller than B. That is, uh, uh, by definition, AI is smaller than BI for every I. Here, A is A1, AK, and B is B1. BK. So let's say that the A is smaller than B. So it means that everybody is here is smaller than here. Now it's pretty obvious if you if you look at the explicit construction of, of Schubert uh, um, sets in this way, it's pretty obvious that if we have uh, a bigger number inside the sequence, it produces a, a stricter condition, like more conditions on our spaces, because uh, we have less place uh, to put our uh, coefficients. So it's pretty obvious that uh, A is smaller than B, if and only if, actually, sigma b is contained in sigma a because b is uh, bigger so it puts more conditions sigma b is contained in sigma a and it's a if and only if of course this ordering is not a total ordering not every two sequences can be um, can be compared yes and so not all the Schubert sets are one contained in the other That's, um, Another property, which we don't prove, is that uh, the class of sigma A in, uh, in the Chow group, the Chow ring or whatever, does not, this is an important property, does not depend on the choice of the flag. This is an important problem because we fixed the flag at, uh, at, at the beginning and we were working uh, with this flag. A priori, if we change the flag, it's something completely different. But the fact is that in the chow ring, it's the same. And so we call it little sigma a and we call this definition sigma A is the Schubert class relative to A. It's a well-defined class in the, in the Chow ring. Now, um, the intersection theory of these uh, classes, so being able to compute uh, all the product, is a kind of big subject. It's called the Schubert calculus. And uh, I hope that in the next lecture, uh, Andras will uh, explain some of this. I hope. I don't know. But up to now, we content ourselves to some much more basic stuff. Uh, which is like the may, maybe the main theorem of uh, 
for Schubert uh, classes. Okay, first of all, definition we call uh, the interior of sigma A the we call it Schubert cell relative to A. So it's the topological interior. So the main theorem of this uh, of this lecture is that uh, sigma a for a sequence the sigma a's form an affine stratification And uh, the co-dimension, moreover, co-dimension of sigma A is, uh, is what we call uh, the modulus of A, which is simply the sum of, uh, of all elements of A. So now you know that this is kind of a big theorem. I mean, this is very useful because uh, we have Totaro's theorem that says that uh, the Chow group, at least, of GRKN is a free group generated by the classes of sigma A. So at least the Chow group, uh, it's, um, it's, well, uh, it's well known. So let's try to prove it. And I think that the best way to prove it is uh, having uh, some uh, scratch about this uh, construction with the zeros, etc., with the matrices. Since now we can uh, we can fix any flag that we want, uh, and uh, and the result we know that uh, it does not depend on the flag. So proof. Now. What does it mean that uh, lambda is in sigma A? Interior. Of course, we have to show that it's a finite stratification, so the interior of the sigma A must be affine spaces. We have to show that. Okay. We have to show that the interior of sigma A is. Uh, isomorphic to an affine space of which dimension? The co-dimension must be this. What's the dimension of the Grassmannian GRKN? What's the dimension of this? No. Yeah. K times N minus K. Minus A. Okay. So this is the dimension GRKN. It's important. Remember it. Okay, we have to show this. Now, if lambda is in the interior of sigma A, what does it mean? Okay, we should first verify that it's a stratification. I leave it to you, or uh, I bet that you, uh, that you believe it. So what does it mean that it's in the, in the interior? It means that it's here and uh, it's not uh, in the union of all the strata which are contained here. So sigma A minus the union of uh, strata contained here means uh, B bigger than A, sigma B.
So let's write, let's draw uh, the matrix. We draw the principal triangle, and then uh, in orange, we have the orange zeros. We have here a k zeros. Here we have uh, I will write it here a k zeros. Here we have uh, a a k minus one orange zeros. I I write this in orange uh, because it uh, only lives in the orange world, so it doesn't. Uh, doesn't see the, the white zeros, etc. And here we have A1 orange zeros. Now we color but we can also be more precise than in the previous case. Because we know that lambda is inside uh, sigma a, but we also know that lambda is not uh, in all the other sigma b that are contained in sigma a. So the last element that we color cannot be zero. Otherwise, uh, here there is one more zero, and so there is another b, another sequence, which is bigger, in which lambda is contained. So it cannot be zero. We can just multiply it by any constant, we can make it one. Okay? Etc. for all the lines. You see? Let, let's write two rows. Sorry, you can assume they are all one? Not all one. All, only the last one is one. I mean, because. Uh, I mean, uh, the fact is that it's not zero, the last coefficient. No, but how can we claim that they are, all the last entries are ones like each? Well, you just uh, choose uh, another element of the basis. I mean, the basis is the same. If you multiply every, uh, sorry, no, the basis is not the same. But the space that they generate, it's the same. Ah, yeah. Lambda is the same. You just shrink some. The, yeah, shrink the element of the basis, but lambda is the same. We can also, uh, yeah, the point is that we can also choose for any vector how, how much to shrink it, but uh, the generated will be exactly the same. Now we can still uh, change uh, the base. Hmm? We can still change the base and make it in which way? I mean, if we subtract, we do some sort of a Gauss operation. If we subtract, for example, for the second base element, the first one, or some multiple of the first one, in the place just beneath, there is zero. And we continue for all the others, and we have a column of zeros. Still, also for the others. Okay. So, okay, so what's uh, in the, notice that one is in the, the i throw, is in which column? i throw, so how many zeros are there here? It's uh, k minus one, that's the i, I throw, so. So it's k minus i. In the first row, there is a k minus one zeros. Second row, k minus two, etc. In the eighth row, there are k minus uh, i white zeros plus a i orange zeros. And there are n. So it's, uh, it's um, so how many of these are there? n minus, so, n minus uh, the zeros that are here, which is uh, k minus i plus ai. 
So n minus k plus i minus ai. Column. Okay. So this form a submatrix. This form there is B a submatrix, which is which is the identity matrix. You just take uh, this submatrix uh, with uh, uh, all the rows and all these columns. It's just the identity matrix. Very good. Now we, I mean, what we can show that uh, lambda here has a unique basis like that. Why so? Because uh, if, if it has another ba any other basis, is taken from this by some multiplication of some matrix, k, k times k. In this case, this matrix, which is the identity matrix, will be multiplied out by, by the same matrix. And so it will not be the identity anymore, simply. So, is contained where? Where is, where is it contained? It's contained in the set of uh, of spaces, whatever uh, lambda, gr, kn, complementary complementary to to which space? A j here we have uh, n minus k with uh, this j l not in in the set not in the set of uh, columns of this matrix. Which are, which are the what are the sets of columns in this matrix? Is this so n minus k plus i minus a. You agree? Because if uh, lambda is here, and we have uh, any, and, and we have, um, well, we have this, uh, this space, if we put uh, also lambda, if we make the direct sum with lambda, since lambda has, uh, by definition, all the elements of this uh, set, well, the sum of this, and lambda will be the whole space. Do you agree? Let's call this U. Now what is U? I mean, let's say lambda in U. Same story, it's uh, the same as, uh, is the same configuration as uh, as A, as uh, sigma A. And also orange zeros.
is the same configuration of this, but But a priori, we cannot say that uh, outside, uh, in the columns outside this index, uh, it's all zeros. For a space, uh, for a vector in U, it's just, okay, it's um, the, um, generated by these vectors. So we must take the columns of these vectors and uh, color it. But when there is one, we have a column of zero. And all the others are colored. Etc. I hope you, and also here, of course. I mean, it's simple. Simply take uh, all these uh, JLs with L not in the set of uh, N minus K plus I minus AI, so not uh, in the submetrics of the identity, and color all the columns. Okay? Now, this is clearly an uh, affine space. So, U is, of course, an affine space because it's. Uh, uh, it's just, uh, okay, you have some fixed ones, uh, and then we have some choices. How many of these choices? We have a K of these. Uh, sorry, we have K of these, so we have uh, how many columns? Uh, N minus K columns and K rows. So this is A, K, N minus K, and we are happy about that. So. We have now embedded the sigma A interior here. What's, what is the codimension? Well, sigma A interior is defined by uh, vanishing of some uh, coordinates. Right, because it's just a vanishing of some elements of this matrix. Because it's the same, just I have zeros above, above and right of the ones. So it's vanishing of some coordinates. How many of these coordinates? Let us look uh, row by row. So the competition is a little bit tricky, but not so, but not difficult. Like uh, how many how many coordinates? So for the last row, last row it's easy. How many coordinates vanish? Just uh, a k. Let's say the row before. So k minus one row. How many coordinates vanish? It's uh, Of course, we have a k. But then we have to add a k because it's, it comes from the last row. But then we have to add what? So how many, how many zeros are in the, in the last row? In the last row, there are a k minus one plus one zeros. Okay. So a k minus one plus one. But 
we have already an annihilate AK of them. So how many are left? Okay, it's, it's uh, the number of zeros which are between BK and uh, BK minus one and BK, where BK is as this. This is, this is sorry, BI. BI is this. Okay, so it's uh, AK plus BK minus one minus BK minus one because uh, we don't co consider the we don't consider the, the extremum <coughs> so it is uh, how much how much is a bk minus one minus bk it is uh, so ak plus well i already did the dista is uh, just ak minus one minus ak AK minus one. Okay. And we, well, okay, last row AK, K minus one row AK minus one, believe that uh, in all the cases it's, it's AI. So all the rows is the sum of AI, which is A. Okay. Have you understood what I, I just did? Because it's a little bit uh, complicated. Isn't the first thing already a fine, the first presentation you gave? Yes, but we, we, we really want to embed it in an affine space of the right dimension and check the co-dimension. Oh. What is that? The, the, the fact is that this has the same dimension as the Grassmannian. That's why. And we, we want uh, like the co-dimension of this. So it means that we, are, we want to embed the cell in A k times n minus k, which is the dimension of the Grassmannian, and check what is the codimension. That's why we did all this computation. But of course, it's clear that it, that is a fine. Yeah, but if it's a fine and you compute the dimension of that way, then are you not done already? Also. Well, and you should get the same, but it, I don't think it's uh, more difficult. I think it, it's exactly the same. Yeah, because you, you just, how do we compute the dimension of this? Well, you should count them, and to count them, you basically take all minus the zeros that you have had. Yeah, I did it, it's not hard. Yeah, it's, uh, but I think it's basically the same. So, but that's done, that's finished. Okay, as a la uh, Yeah, just very quickly. Okay, uh, some uh, remark. Let us consider a vector bundle. with the gamma one, gamma m sections that generate each fiber. Okay. And take V, like uh, independent of course. Take V, the vector space generated by this section inside gamma V, which has dimension V. And we know that we have uh, seen, some, like last lecture, that we then have a map uh, from X to the Grassmannian. Uh, here we have, um, this is rank R. M minus R, W, which with X that goes 
in the kernel of the map that goes from uh, from w to vx, which is evaluation at x. This is surjective, so the kernel has uh, dimension m minus r. Right? We, we have seen it last time. Now, uh, here we have Schubert classes, and here we have Chern classes. Let's uh, write this as pi gr. I think we called it pi gr. What is CIV? Is, by definition, the locus of, here we have um, how many? R minus psi plus one, right? If I'm not mistaken. Which is, here in W we have a flag, which is gamma one, gamma one, gamma m minus one, W. Here we have a flag, a complete flag. And what does it mean, this? It means that the kernel of the evaluation map intersects what v r minus one plus one, right? Sort of, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And this is the same as uh, if, you, if you recheck uh, it, uh, like it's, uh, it's some condition of uh, non-trivially intersect some space in the flag. This is, sorry, the, these are the WI, okay? Some condition of non-intersecting, uh, uh, intersecting non-trivially some element of the flag. And this is, uh, check it at home because it, uh, this is the same as uh, PGR star of uh, what we call this sigma I zero. So this means that uh, any uh, churn class is the pullback of some particular Schubert class and also of an easy one. That's why Schubert calculus is so important because uh, since any churn class is pullback and with naturality condition, if we know Schubert calculus, we know a big amount of stuff in intersection theory of churn classes. Except that Schubert calculus is even more difficult probably that in most of the cases, okay, thank you.